Welcome to Out of the Box with Christine, the podcast for conscious entrepreneurs. Are you willing to step into your greatness? Are you ready to shine? Well, get ready, truth seeker. You're in for an amazing ride. And now, here's the host of the show, Christine Blasdale. Welcome back to Out of the Box with Christine. I am your host, Christine Blasdale, your motivational multimedia coach. I help people create podcasts, branding, you name it. And today I am super excited about an element. I mean, the show is called Out of the Box with Christine, the podcast for conscious entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you so much about the people that I work with, entrepreneurs, business owners. They start off with this great joy in their heart to say, I'm going to be a blank, blank, blank. I'm going to do this. I'm going to change the world. And then somewhere along the line, something happens and all that joy gets sucked out of their whole business model. And so today I'm super excited ab about my guest. I have on today, Dr. Aaron Baker, who is a transformational self-leadership coach, um, an author, social psychologist. Wow. And also a lifelong shift starter, which I love because yes. <laughs> we like starting some shift around here right. as well on Out of the Box. So welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Erin. Well, thank you for having me. And as someone who lives my whole life gender wise outside of all boxes, I am just excited to be out of the box with you for oh, yes. our conversation, right? We are family. <laughs> yeah, I love it when people because you know, how do you you know how do you identify how do you I still identify as that little kid that you know five year old kid who would you know dress up in cowboy outfits and you know uh, be a scientist one day and and I was just Christine and I went through all those different yeah. you know all those different phases call me Chris <laughs> my name is Chris um, <laughs> I see I how just, you like get up your. Your, your chest puffs yeah. up, call me Chris. Call me Chris. <laughs> right? My yep. grandmother at 11 years old, she's like, your name is not Chris. <laughs> I go, yes, it is. <laughs> okay, Chris. <laughs> but um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have you on and, and talking about a subject that I really love, and that is joy and yes. how, we can, how we can bring back some of that joy into our lives, or if we have it already, how we can maybe keep it and hold on to it a little bit longer but um let's talk about you you have a uh, an amazing book out as well and yes. um i just i love the title can you tell the, our listeners yeah. and our viewers what the title is yes joyful af the essential business strategy we're afraid to put first and i'm wearing a bow tie today because the bow tie is on the cover and i just had a book launch party and so i figured i'm recording with christine later today i'm just going to keep the bow tie on I like the bow, bow tie. ties are joy they are a symbol of joy and they're a symbol they, of me they are they always bring joy especially you're very cool for those that are listening to the podcast on like apple or spotify you need to jump on to youtube and, and watch the show because uh aaron is wearing this very colorful beautiful bow tie um yes I like it. It's large. <laughs> it's yes, it's it, it's it's one that actually has to be tied. It's not the clip on. So my wife oh. actually learned. She watched YouTube videos to make sure she learned how to tie a bow tie for me. I could not do it on my own. We Part of my joy is not knowing how to do it all. <laughs> I love YouTube because I've gone there. Yes. How do you yes. fix a jacuzzi that is, you know, how do you whatever it is? It's yes. the it's the Encyclopedia Britannica of our day. It really is. And Alton Brown, who is a celebrity chef, is also a bow tie connoisseur, and he has taught us many a thing about food and bow ties. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. So let's talk about this. Is, let's talk about first of all, um, you're a social psychologist. Yeah. And yeah. that is uh, entailing what would you say is the study of society and cultures. Yeah, it's it's more of how do we show up as human beings? Mm -hmm. How do we think? How do we feel? How do we behave? Whether it's in the presence of other people or even the imagined presence of other people. So it could be anything from how do we set goals? How are we motivated? How do we show up in group settings? Anything that is involving our social world. And I, I, I like to put it as it's everything that's not clinical psychology, right? So clinical psychology is really around what's happening in the mental health 
realm yes. and social psychology is what's happening in ourselves, in our brains, in our thoughts, in our feelings as we navigate this world that is inherently social. And and sometimes bizarre. <laughs> and very bizarre. I mean, I I am the quintessential I wanted to understand people so because I didn't understand them and so I went and got a PhD in it. There you go. <laughs> right. And as I still you, as you do. As a and as a coach, I think that's still what I'm trying to do. I'm asking a lot of questions selfishly to understand people. And at the same time, they're getting a lot of transformation. Well, and that and that leads me to the next thing, too. You're a, a transformational self-leadership coach. And yes. so you work with people around that whole thing. I would say, too, that we as human beings are quite worried or concerned about what other people think of us all the time and this is the this what i would think is probably one of the number one joy killers right because we have yes. this beautiful thing inside of us and we're like i'm so excited you know it starts off when you're little again like like when i was mm -hmm. you know a little kid wearing my cowboy outfit or you know whatever being super excited about something and then as we get a little bit older all of a sudden we go oh well what will my friends say the 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 tribe right the tribe mm -hmm, in the cave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what will the cave mm -hmm. dwellers say? Um, I want to be accepted. I need to feel like I belong. And mm -hmm. then we start comparing ourselves and worrying about what other people think of us. Would you, is that like a, a joy killer? Am I on track with that? You are very much on track. And I will say, let's go back to how I think about joy. And I really think joy is all about how we connect to who we are what lights us up, what's important to us, how we best operate, how our brains work. And so, yeah, a joy killer is that, what are people gonna think of me? Or how do other people do this thing, right? We're taught sort of from childhood on about there are right or wrong answers, there's ways to do things in the world. And so a, a huge stealer of our joy is when we think that somebody else knows how to show up in the world better than we do or show up in our business. It's one of the reasons I write it about business is inherently our business is social, no matter what business you're in. And so much of our joy killers are, what are people going to think of me as the business owner? Whether it's I'm posting on online content, I'm, you know, a host of a podcast. What are people going to think of me? And so we chameleon ourselves into being what we think a good business owner is or a good partner or whatever context you're in, because we do fear that we're going to get kicked out of the, the, the circle, right? We want to belong yeah. so desperately. <laughs> and that's that primordial, whatever primitive <laughs> part of our brain that is, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's about fight or flight. It's about yes. surviving and mm -hmm. maybe many, 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 many lifetimes ago at one point, you know, we, you know, we had to be, we had to assimilate in order yes. to survive because if not, we did get kicked out of the cave and then we got to see how fast we can run from, you know, some very hungry dinosaur. Um, <laughs> and so we were kind of, that's, it's, it, would you say that's hardwired into yes. our brains? And so yes. we have to re, we have to unlearn that. Yeah. So we're hardwired for connection. We're hardwired for community and survival. So yes, everything that is true. And we grow up in our current society with what creates connection is, yeah, trying to fit in, right? Not belong. Brene Brown has that great distinction between fitting in and belonging. And so, yeah, we learn, okay, our survival strategy to be accepted and loved by our parents is our first circle of people that we're in, right? And then, so how do we, how do we get that acceptance? And then we have our peer groups. And then as we get older, it's these more and more groups come along and we're, okay, how do I get accepted here? How do I get accepted here? And so all of it comes down to what is the norm of that group, right? And how do I make sure I fit into that norm? And we see it in our current society. People who don't fit in those norms are there. People are terrified of them. I'm, as someone who doesn't fit into a gender box, people are terrified of me because I'm unpredictable. People want me to fit into a box because if everybody acts the same, is the same, we can predict everything and everyone belongs and it's harmony. That's the assumption, at least. That's the assumption. Yeah. And that right. need to feel. Um, especially when we're younger, that need to feel part of a group, you know, um, I, I know, oh my goodness, I know when I was really young in elementary school, I believe it was, was 
um, you know, we, we'd have slumber parties. Uh, you know, I, I was born in 1964. So uh, we're talking early 70s. And um, mm-hmm. we'd have the uh, the slumber parties where we tell scary stories. And but they were your, you know, your best mates, your best friends. And and, and it was your little tiny crew. And I remember vividly um, one time where we had our little slumber party and there was a girl that was there that um, uh, eventually after the slumber party became ostracized. And basically she, uh, they, they said, you know, she likes girls, this girl, mm. this girl likes girls and, um, and we can't have her at the slumber parties anymore. And they would make fun of her. And, and I mean, horrible, horrible things. Right. And I remember at that age, I didn't know. I didn't know that I had a secret crush on all my best friends, right? I didn't know. Right. I just, I just loved being around my best friends, and um, and I didn't. I had no gay uh, representatives on, you know, in society. There were none mm-hmm. at all. There was mm-hmm. no Ellen. Uh, you know, there there's just nobody. Um, Liberace, but he still. Everybody thought he was supposed to be straight, and I'm like, he is not straight. Definitely not. <laughs> but there was just nothing. Um, Mm -hmm. And so all I remember was that, again, being afraid of being thrown out of the cave, I said, Mm -hmm. whatever she is, I don't ever want to be. I mean, I like as a kid, I remember stating that whatever she is, I don't want to be because I always I want to be invited to these slumber parties and I want to be with my friends and I I don't want to be what she is. And Mm. then, you know, of course, as you grow older and you then you find out you're like, oh, that's who I am, you know. (laughs) Okay, but Mm. it isn't it isn't it sad that that at such a young age, too, that even children are saying you don't belong, you know, with us and the devastation that that I think about that. I think about that girl now. I mean, I think about what she had to go through then because there was no acceptance in those days. Did you have a similar well, kind of experience when you were young or maybe I yourself? did, I did. And it was, it was more of, I didn't notice that I didn't belong until about middle school. I was a tomboy, which now clearly translates into non-binary gender, but tomboy, basketball player, athlete, and hung out with all the boys. And that was fine. And I didn't know there was a quote unquote problem until middle school when that's when people were starting to have these more cliquish things. The thing that really strikes me is that was more prevalent for me. And I'm curious if this was true for you when you came out, but when I came out in college, I didn't feel gay enough. So I was now, once I decided I was gay or not decided, it's not a choice for me, but once I kind of realized I was gay, I was looking at, well, how do they dress, (laughs) right? What is, what is the gay uniform? How do they show up? And, I was leaving the safety of one place where I had been trying for years to be that straight girl. Now moving into this gay community and going from one form of how do I belong to the other form rather than, hey, what what's me, right? Absolutely. Oh, I yes, I remember that as well. <laughs> And you know, <laughs> what do I wear? How do I wear my hair? What am right? I supposed to do? Is it short hair? Is it? Yeah. I mean, literally, I fretted more about my outfit trying to fit into the gay community than I did trying to fit into the straight community. But when you, but like trying to fit into the straight community, um, and again, especially when when I was younger, I felt like it was a survival thing, right? Because mm-hmm, I was mm-hmm. like, I've just nope. I heard too many weird stories, mm-hmm. um, and and how difficult it was it's like putting a, a square peg in a circle you know the, like mm-hmm. it, 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 it was just so difficult but the need to feel that you fit in was yeah. overriding that need to be myself because it was just too scary and I think it was true because again I didn't have those examples of of people that were courageous enough to to you know to come out and say this is who I love or this is who I am or anything like that but yeah I I remember that vividly and how uncomfortable I was and then when I realized you know what the the time I realized it was it wasn't after all the failed relationships with men and that feeling like (laughs) what is wrong here (laughs) why do I not understand them um it was when I saw basic instinct (laughs) with Sharon Stone Uh 
Fair if enough. I, Sharon Stone will do it. <laughs> if I ever meet Sharon Stone, I'm going to just say you, 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 you're the, you were the thing that, you know, what was it? The straw that yep. broke the camel's back. You yep. were the thing that I saw that movie and I just went, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> I mean, we all have those moments, right? Same thing happened Mine to me in Greece with it when I was watching Greece with the oh, Olivia wow. Newton John. You know, I yeah. didn't want to. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be with John Travolta. I wanted to be John Travolta. Yeah, I was like, yeah. Well, I get it. And I watched Fry Green Tomatoes in 1991, oh, and I wanted to be A.G. Threadgood. <laughs> and Ruth Jameson was the love of my life. But I didn't know that as a seven-year-old in 1991, but it became apparent at some point down the line. Oh. That makes sense I want now. To, I want to be Iggy. Okay. I get that. I still remember when I came out to my parents, uh, uh, I thought my family, my immediate family, um, it was it was that thing. I was like, I'm going to have the talk today. You know, I gathered up all my courage and my strength and and I said, you know, I'm looking in the mirror. Do I look too gay? I don't know. Ugh. And so I went to talk and um, I was worried about, well, I was worried about everybody, but I was worried about um, my grandmother and my dad because my grandmother really raised me. I was her little, you know, chicken. I was just like the, the love of her life. Um, and I just couldn't bear my grandmother, like not accepting me or, you know, looking at me with disappointment. Um, and my mm. dad was like very conservative, uh, um, not socially conservative, but uh, a Republican, like Rush Limbaugh kind of guy, Fox oh, News. Boy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh boy. So I was like, uh -huh. oh, this is not going to be good with my dad. And and we had a, a, a tough relationship because of that. Um, so when I came out to them, um, first of all, my grandmother's just like, are you still my little, you know, are you still my little girl? Are you still, you know, are you still Christine? Are you still my baby? And I was like, yes, I am. She's like, of course, I love you no matter what. Cool. Went to my dad. My dad, this Republican, you know, dude who I didn't think was very, he's like, of, he goes, I knew you. He goes, I've, I've known you. You were gay since you were a kid. You had fair wow. faucet posters on your wall and you loved the bionic woman and wonder woman. And, and he goes, I could, he goes, I, I knew. And, and he goes, of course I love you. And I was like, Whoa. And it was wow. when I told my mom who had dreams of Christine growing up to marry a, an attorney or a doctor or, you know, someone to take care of her. And in her mind, the, you know, she thought also I would get beaten up. I'd, I'd get murdered right? Or something horrible. She went to the, the other place. So it was out of fear um, that mm -hmm. she was so disappointed and, and, and stressed. What about you when you came out? Yeah. So, you know, it was early 2000s. It was college for me. And <clears throat> it was a, a time when I think, you know, I think Ellen had already done some of her coming out phase of things. And there were a few ballot measures. I was living in Michigan at the time, and I think Michigan had banned gay marriage. Um, and I remember <laughs> it was real fun. I, my best friend at the time had gone and we were in college. She was my roommate for the summer and she'd gone on a trip to the Dominican Republic and I was all alone by myself. And I had been head over heels in love with this teaching assistant in college. And so I was going to go on a drive to clear my head, pulled out of my parking lot, crashed my car into someone in the parking lot. My best friend is gone. I'm all alone. So I call my mother. And then what comes out of me in teary eyes is, mom, I crashed my car and I'm in love with a girl. <laughs> and my mom had no idea what to do with that. So it turned out that um, it took her a little while, but she was very, very much like, you know, she had been raised as a Christian. And so she had some stuff that she had to grapple with, but not, not much. My dad and I at the time were not really close, but later on a similar response that your dad had, which was like, we always kind of knew. Yeah. And I thought he was going to be the one, he wasn't conservative by any stretch, but I just thought he was going to be the one that was going to be less okay with it. And no, he was, he was totally, totally fine. But they were worried about me in the early 2000s because this was before that big push, you know, for gay marriage well, yeah. happened. And, yeah. Even with the whole Ellen thing, I remember when uh, they were writing it, they had it in the script or something that she was, they were talking about yeah. the episode that was going to come out of her coming out. And, yeah. you know, they had bomb threats on the set. I mean, mm -hmm. come on. Um, they had people yeah. losing their minds over it. They were, um, 
uh, contacting the advertisers, uh, saying we're not going to buy any Ford, whatever, whatever the advertiser was. I don't know who, who yeah. it was, but um, it, it was just like it was the end of the world with just this TV show with this one episode of her, you know, coming yeah. out. But then yeah. from that, you know, then also look, you know, with um with same sex marriage opening up, right? Um, here in Australia, that it uh it wasn't at the same time as America, so it took a little while, but that also happened here. And guess what, folks? The end of the world has not happened. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> we have not. We have not taken all of your children and brought them to the rainbow side. You know, yeah. that was the thing too, was that the, the, yeah. the oh, they're going to turn a, they're going to abuse yeah. our children. And, uh, and I'm like, and you know, who the biggest complaints or complainers were saying that if same sex marriage um, went through, that there would be child abuse and sexual child abuse. You know who it was? It was the Catholic Once, church. Yes. Who were perpetuating it themselves. The, the... Catholic church saying that yep. uh, another group of people were going to be abusing children i find that mm -hmm, quite mm -hmm. hilarious in a very sinister way but yeah, yeah. so uh so we're so we're here now <laughs> yeah we're here we're queer we're, queer. we're fabulous <laughs> we're just fabulous here we're joyful all of those things <laughs> yes yes so t let's talk about say let's talk about a little bit more um about for, for folks that are finding themselves really wanting to tap into that joy maybe they mm -hmm. you know yeah, it's been a rough couple of years okay if you haven't yes. noticed there's a pandemic uh, <laughs> only been, noticed a little bit just, just a, little a little bit little. um the anxiety and stress of not knowing of just not knowing mm -hmm. what's gonna happen mm -hmm. what's around the corner um but there's been, you know, illness, there's been death, there's been all these uh, things. And so joy is sometimes a hard thing to find, you know, when yes. you're in your um, in your day to day activities. I find my joy my own way. But I'm just wondering if you can help our um, our viewers on YouTube and our listeners yeah. to the podcast out a little bit. What are some things that we can do to help tap into that joy? Yeah. So I want to start with, especially in COVID times, it's not only hard to find our joy, there's a guilt we feel around finding our joy. And so I want to start with, we need joy for resilience. Um, this is something that I, I heard uh, an author named Karen Walrand talk about in her book, The Lightmaker's Manifesto. And it really struck me as how do we keep our joy tank full? Because during times of uncertainty, crisis, our joy is what keeps us going. Mm -hmm. And so not only is it important for us to allow ourselves permission for joy, but figure out ways to tap into it. And one of the things I, I did a whole lot of, I'm an academic at heart. So I went and studied how did academics talk about joy? And then I went and talked to people about what is joy for them. And I found that joy is this very different thing for each of us. So I'm not going to have a prescription of go look at the sunset or go meditate or go be you. All of those things, yes, can contribute to joy. But what I really came to after I started talking to a lot of people is that there's really four basic ingredients to this joy recipe. And I think of it, there's a cookbook by Samin Nosrat called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And that's the four elements of good cooking. And I think the, the same idea is true for joy. So the salt, fat, acid, and heat of joy are connection, curiosity, creativity, and courage. And connection is almost like salt. Salt is in everything, right? It's got its own flavor, but it enhances the flavor. So connection, that could be connection to self, that could be connection to other people, that can be connection to spirit, higher power, whatever oneness f feels good to you. Curiosity is, how do you get back to a state of, I wonder what happens if, or I wonder if. Uh, curiosity is a thing, we're talking about childhood, that we are naturally able to do as children that kind of gets subtly encouraged out of us, right? We have these phrases like, curiosity killed the cat. Well, God, if it killed a cat, it must be terrible, right? <laughs> Um, creativity is a childlike thing. You know, we finger paint when we're kids and then all of a sudden creativity becomes this thing of art and no, we're all creating all the time. 
And then courage, I think, is a it seems like an outlier, but it's really not. If you think about the most satisfied you are in your life, it's the times when you've taken a risk. It's when you've moved through challenge, right? Um, the, the most boring thing we can do in life is set out on a path and achieve that goal without any sort of challenge. So if we think about how do we encourage or how do we incorporate those four elements into our day, it's really simple. It's what's one tiny way I can connect today? It could be as simple as sending a text to a friend and saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. It could be something simple as journaling for yourself. What's one thing I can get curious about today? Maybe it's you go down an internet rabbit hole, or maybe it's, oh, I'm doing something in my business. I wonder what would happen if I tried this. Creativity, same thing. What's one little thing you can create today? It could be a single word. <laughs> and then courage, the same. What's one tiny risk I can take today? And I use the word tiny because it really doesn't have to be this grand gesture. But when you start thinking about these tiny ways you can engage in connection, curiosity, creativity, courage, you start filling that joy tank and you start building that resilience for the long term. And then, so then also when you are hit with something that is really sucky, um, yeah. then it doesn't go to, also it doesn't go to that thing where you spiral down the drain where, yes, right? Yes. You have a, there's a little bit of buoyancy still within you that, um, yeah. that you can go, okay, this really, this does really suck and oh, we're, we're going to get through it. But also to find the things within that, that are are beneficial which yeah. is which is difficult sometimes um yes uh, case in point is i i recently i lost my mother um well she, she she decided to pass and um i remember of course the shock of it and and missing her is just overwhelming um yeah. and and that can't be denied but i remember um and I don't know if this is my internal, I think this is also from my childhood as well, of having to learn how to adapt to kind of not to, to some sucky things, to learning to adapt to that and make the best of it. And so, I, you know, of course, the, the loss and the, the shock of, of my mom passing. But then I realized, too, she went in such a beautiful way. Hmm. She went quickly. I mean, so quick. She was dressed to the nines because she was going to be meeting mm. a friend of hers. So she was, my mother was, is very, uh, she's from Morocco. She's very French coquette. And the way she looked was very important to her. It's even mm. in her eighties, right? She was, had to be dressed to the nines. So she was already, um, she was getting ready. She was speaking French to her best friend on the phone, laughing. Mm. So I'm like, you know, she wasn't languishing in a hospital bed. She wasn't in, you know, for months or, you know, days in great pain it went mm. quickly. It went the way she would have wanted it. And so I sort of was able to, um, with that grief, also match that with, I'm absolutely grateful that she did, yeah. that she went that way. Does that? Yeah. Does that yeah, make makes sense. I mean, joy is one of the few emotions that we can feel alongside all the other yeah. emotions, right? Yeah. We talk about we can have joy and sorrow and joy and grief. And I think even just being more aware of the ways we can feel joy when we're in a negative space, whatever that pain, anger, fear, sorrow is, is really beneficial. And I personally think to be joyful, which I spell it F U L L, um, is really to be receptive and present to the full range of the human experience. And there is joy in being able to witness, things that are really tough, like the passing of a parent. There's joy in the grief. There's joy and gratitude in seeing the fullness of everything that happens in our lives, even as even if it's painful. I mean, we are hardwired to avoid pain as human beings, and yet there is so much for us in experiencing the pain. And I, I really think that the more we're able to feel those those tender down moments, the more joy we can feel on the yeah, other side of it. I think so too. And not, and also what helps too is not labeling everything. Mm, yes. Do you know, we, we do tend to label things. We like to put it yes. in a box, right? We like yes, to say, yes, this sucks. This goes yep. in the, this sucks box. Um, mm -hmm. this is good. 
I'll put this mm-hmm. in the and and that's not life. Sometimes life has got a little bit of you know there's there's a little bit of everything. I know that yep. uh, you know I mean I eventually I did I was my, my wife found me I guess on Instagram it was just total sheer luck. Um, I came across her Instagram feed. She stalked me for a while and then started you know inbox me. It's a great love story as you do <laughs> stalk as you do. <laughs> I'm like, where do you live? She sent me a picture. I go, oh, maybe it's Hawaii or Florida. And she's like, no, it's Australia. I'm like, I'm in Los Angeles. What are you talking about, Australia? Surprise. But, but anyway, the, the 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 moral of that story is, is not, I didn't meet her until I was in my 50s. And I had a lot of, you know how they say you have to kiss a lot of frogs? Mm-hmm. I kissed a lot of frogs. And and even my last you know experience with another human bringing another human in my life it was a narcissist crazy freaking so my it really messed up my head um I didn't trust anyone for that moment I was like you know what I'm fine with just me and my dog we're good Mm -hmm. and but it was it was like as if I had to go through all of that in order to when I did meet my my beautiful baby now that I was like, yes, you're it. Mm-hmm. All that other stuff, all those other people were not it. I didn't feel right, but I needed to go through that also in order to be present and to be the person I am today for my mm-hmm. beautiful baby, right? Yeah. yeah. But it, but other people could look at that and example. go, I don't trust people. I hate them. Um, they're, you know, nothing but a blah, 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 right? Yeah. And the trust. Yeah. It could ruin the trust. Um, that's why I think narcissists really—they need a, an island where they can all go and just be narcissistic with each other. The island of narcissists. <laughs> the island of narcissists. I do. I think that they need to go there because yeah. they don't have yeah. empathy. Yeah, and yeah. that's a dangerous person. If you don't have empathy, you <laughs> very much so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. again, sometimes those things that we go through, um, but it is a frame of mind. You know, yeah. I it could, I could be every very easily have gone. No, this sucks. Why do people hurt me? Drinking, whatever. Yeah. You know, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think those are very real and valid things. And I like the word "and" a lot. I out, living outside of the gender box. I I am a walking and, um, <laughs> and thinking about how can we uh, uh, acknowledge that yes, people suck sometimes and it hurts and this is what I'm meant to go through and there's somebody else out there for me. And the pain is allowing me the fullness of the human experience as much as this sucks in this particular moment. Yes. And it's hard yeah. sometimes in the, in the moment when it's happening. It's to you, hard. You go, it's oh, hard. Yay. That's why. I, right. No. And I, that's why I'm a very big fan of therapy, coaching, support, all of those things, Absolutely. because um, we need, we need that and we need to be allowed to feel this. We have to be in the suck. We're allowed to be in the suck and we're allowed to have people help us understand that the suck is temporary and will move us towards things. Absolutely. I think that they are allowing yourself to be in that situation. Don't sit there, not necessarily sit there and wallow and know when you're starting to do some unhealthy coping mechanisms. Right. If you need to throw yourself on the bed and have a tanty, that's fine. Um, but just yeah. don't stay there for years. <laughs> yes <laughs> yes because yeah you're not doing yourself any good or it's people that love you uh you know either yeah yeah but we definitely need to feel those feelings i think that's really important um is letting ourselves because most of our negative emotions most emotions are pretty fleeting so if you let yourself have that cry or have that sh- that scream it'll go away <laughs> it's yeah. it's actually when we're trying to bury it like a kickboard under the water that it becomes a problem, right? You know how hard it is to hold a kickboard under the water. It's painstaking. And then it'll pop up and smack you in the face at the weirdest of moments. So you might as well just like let that kickboard come to the surface, feel the feelings, and it'll go away. I like that. (laughs) Because I've had that happen several times. Yeah. So what what would you you say, Dr. Aaron, what would you say are some um, of the more of the, the common um drains and leaks um to our joy what are some things that you in your practice have come across with your clients yeah so i'll say they're all under the umbrella of ways we look outside of ourselves for answers so um anything from 
and I, I talk about a lot in the context of business, but you could apply it outside of business to anything, but it's when we have a litany of shoulds, where do those shoulds come from? Most of the time, it's not a should we've put upon ourselves. It's a should that has been created by, we've been taught this is what a good in entrepreneurship, this is what a good business does, or um, this is what the gurus have said, or this is what society has told us, right? There are a lot of shoulds that are wrapped up in capitalism, patriarchy, um, you know, all of our societal systems. So shoulds are a big one. Um, following blueprints and formulas, which is very, very common. I can't tell you how often I get LinkedIn messages from people who have the 10 step formula to solving every problem I have. <laughs> right. I, I hate LinkedIn people who inbox me the first thing and say, we can get you six figure mm -hmm. bloody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh like my God. The, you and me both. We have those people right, yeah. all the time. Right. The, the formulas are out there. Oh, it's God. experts. Um, I have a former mentor who people will follow his words word for word, like scripts. I don't know if that's what he intends, but that's what people do. And that's, that's his way of doing things. That's his words. I can tell you anytime I've tried to mimic him and show up, you know, as powerfully as he does, it's not me. It's not my words. It backfires completely. Yeah. Um, we drain our joy when we look for, this is going to be a, a, a little bit of a mind twist, but when we chase happiness. So joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness is uh, something that happens based on an external circumstance. We get that job, we get that revenue goal, we buy the house, and all of that is uh, dependent on us achieving something, right? The circumstance has to be a positive, and we've already talked about joy, it doesn't always have to be in the positive, but it's always about some goal that's out in the future. And so what we do is we chase, when I hit that revenue target, I will be happy. Right. When I hit that revenue target, I will be worthy. I will be enough. I will call myself a capable entrepreneur. So we drain our joy because we're constantly chasing that thing out there rather than saying, what's the joyful thing I can be doing now? Right. Right. And then oh, I, I've never met a human being who's gotten that goal and then permanently been happy. If they're out there, please message me. Let me know because you are uh, someone I want to study. <laughs> but I've never actually had somebody say, yeah, I hit that revenue target and I was happy forever. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, and and yeah. also, would you say to um, finding joy in unjoyous things? Yes. In unjoyous yeah. tasks. I don't even know, I know if unjoyous is a word. I'd probably not. Um, I like making stuff up, so go for it. <laughs> this is something too that, and, and with, well, with yeah. raising children too. And, mm -hmm. um, in, cause there's some things in life again, that are not super fun to do. Mm -hmm. They're necessary to do. Yeah. But, um, I like being able to bring, um, uh, an aspect of joy to those tasks. If that yeah. makes sense. Yes. Um, it's it's a little fun to bring a whole lot of joy when I'm doing my taxes per se, but I do a spin on it so that it's like I sequester myself for a couple of days and I say, okay, I'm going to go through all my stuff because I'm the I'm the I'm the person with the you know the shoebox and the receipts. I'm that kind mm -hmm. of person. So yep. I'll go through everything and I'll sequester myself for two days and get everything all in order, categorize everything, okay, and then and then finally you know send it off to um, to the accountant. Now, what I like to do, because every, a lot of people say, I have to pay my taxes or I have to do my taxes. What I like to do is use the language and flip it and say, I get to do my taxes. Mm -hmm. I even got to the point, I don't do it now anymore because I don't do checks, but I used to write when, when I had to write my tax check to the IRS, um, I would write in the memo part of it please use for peaceful and beautiful purposes. Mm. Now, they're not going to read that and they're not going to. No, but the joy still, is not about them. It's about you. It's, it's still, all about you. 80 cents to the dollar is going to the military and whatever yes. thing they want to yep. do. But it was yep. just, that was my intention. And, yeah. and the thing is, is that I get to pay my taxes it means I made enough money. I was successful enough that I get mm -hmm. to, to pay my taxes instead of saying I have to. Yes. Do you understand? Yes. 
Oh, absolutely. And and what you're speaking to is the way you've implicitly asked yourself the question, what's my joyful way of doing my taxes? Right. Right. So for you, it's that reframe, that mindset shift, right, of I get to pay my taxes. I was literally talking to somebody earlier today. I asked him the same question about taxes. For him, paying his taxes joyfully means getting on a Zoom call and doing it with somebody else. He has a set of friends that they get on Zoom once a week and they do the tasks that they don't want to do together. Right. I and like so that. Right. And I just I love this thought of anything that is not joyful. Just asking yourself, what is the way to do it joyfully? Is it a mindset shift? Is it um, listening to music while I do it? Is it, you know, going somewhere different than I normally do it? Was it having companionship? Whatever brings you joy, go for it. The, and, and it doesn't take much. I mean, you're talking about this little thing you do writing on the checks that clearly brings nothing to the government, but all the joy to you. And look how small of an act mm -hmm. creates a shift for you in how you feel about doing your taxes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I've, I've, and I've been doing that for several, you know, several years and being grateful to, um, um, being grateful to to give my money to, to, to but it's again it's because I it, you know because I'm successful if I wasn't successful yeah. and I made no money I wouldn't know any taxes so right it's, you know it's that that's the thing it's doing yeah. the reframe which I think is really important yes. and I heard of yes. a group too this was uh, you were talking about the zoom thing um oh my goodness we have oh my gosh we have so little time okay um I, I heard of a um of a group that um that, that they work they're all working on on their books or uh on writing projects and mm -hmm. they do um a zoom working uh meeting where they're on for either an hour or maybe even two hours and what they do is they all come on at the same time um they just say they have a quick couple minutes of like what are you working on you know are you stumbling anywhere you know do you need any help on anything nope nope i'm mm -hmm. all good okay yeah okay blah, 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 blah. and then they set the timer on the screen and everybody works on their own project. They're alone on the computer typing in their, you know, doing all their writing, but they know that they have this group yeah. as well. So then yeah. they take a, they'll take a break. Um, they'll go, how was that? Oh my God, it was so great. Or I got so much done. And it's really interesting because it's, it's especially for writers because it's a, can be an isolating experience sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's a way for you to be in community, but still get yes. your work done. Well, and actually I talk about this concept in my book. I call it running buddies um, mm -hmm. because I think about how often runners, it's a solo endeavor running, but how often people find partners for it. And there's actually, there's apps. You can go find running buddies. In entrepreneurship, we don't have an app to go, to go find people to do things. And it's not, it's not the same as, you know, you show up to a community once every few weeks and kind of talk about what's going well and what's not going well. It's the act of doing it with, right? And so yeah. I have been consciously creating spaces for myself because I've learned that my joy is really dependent on having running buddies. So whether it's, I need to get my butt on some social media and having three people where we're all doing a social media challenge together. Or right now I've got two guys I meet every Friday morning and we all want to launch group programs in January. So we're coming together on Friday to talk about Brilliant. what we're going to do for the next few months together to get our respective groups out. And that is joy, right? For me, having a running buddy. And what I want to speak to underneath that is part of finding joy is learning where do you need support? Where do you not want to do this alone? Connection being one of those big joy ingredients is yeah. in this world, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, we are desperate for people to be in community with. And how can you do that when so much of your work or your life is a solo endeavor? And how can you create what you need? I like that. I like that a lot. And it, especially with entrepreneurs, um, people who have their own business, coaches, consultants, we, uh, for very, it can be very isolating and, and alone, but you also have that feeling of, it's just me. I've got to grind. I got to work hard. I need more, mm -hmm. whatever it is. I need more clients. I, I need to hustle. I got to da, 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 da. And 
what I find that I really love, um, I love doing, this is what brings me joy, um, is doing co-ventures. So mm. I know what I'm really good at. And I'm, I have no problem saying I am really good at this. I am, um, I'm a great communicator. <laughs> I've been in radio and broadcasting for 20 years. I love teaching people how to communicate their expertise with the world. I love teaching them how to create a podcast and, and getting out on YouTube and all that stuff, right? And getting booked on shows. I love that. I love helping them get booked on radio and, and, and podcast. But there's the skill sets that I don't have that someone else has and my audience and their audience would benefit from us together. Yes. And we have, isn't it funny because as coaches and consultants too, there's this thing of the scarcity model where, you know, I, you know, these, I, they're just my clients, you know, I've never yeah. been that way because they're not just my clients. So if I can yes. bring on, and I love co-ventures where someone else has very vastly different skill sets than I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we complement each other. And yes. so, you know, so if I can do a co-venture with, um, with a, a certified, with a publicist that compliments me. Um, mm -hmm. I do co-ventures with a, a woman, Susie Pruden, who does, um, she's an amazing book publisher and helps create, you know, number one bestsellers. Well, that, that compliments what I do. And that's yeah. where the joy is because I get to be, um, her people get to know me, my people get to know her and there is no scarcity model because we, we all rise. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I am. I love the same thing. And, and I'm exploring a lot more of that in my business. I don't, I love going alone. I also love collaboration and coming from an academic background. That's what, what is the norm. So I, I want to say that I heard from a former mentor of mine that find one plus one equals 11 relationships, not one plus one equals two. Oh, <laughs> one like plus that. one equals 11. And what he speaks to is exactly what you're talking about. Christine is find people who have complementary skill sets. So when you come together, you've created an exponential collaboration. And I'm very much on that same page of there are billions of people on this planet. There's plenty of people that we can serve and yeah. you know, Sometimes people need a hamburger and French fries. You yes. can be the hamburger and somebody else can be the French fries, but like they can't just have the hamburger. They need the French fries, but you really just, you can't have the French fries without the hamburger. You just have to have the combination. So I'm, I'm with you. That's very much part of my joy. And I, I think it's part of a lot of people's joy, but it's not something we're taught how to do well in entrepreneurship because there's a lot no. of, at least I face this with a lot of clients of this belief of if I can't do it alone, I'm not good enough. Yes. Yes. Well, and also, and, the, and again, it's that scarcity model. It's that mm -hmm. it's feeling that there's not enough to go around. Um, right. Which and, goes yeah. back to, I'm not good enough. Right. Yeah. Cause if, if, if they don't want to work with me, they work with Christine. It's cause I'm not good enough. Right. <laughs> rather, right. rather than, Oh, no, there's a thing that Christine you know offers. That's different. Listen, if my toilet backs up, I'm calling a plumber. Right. Or my Fair car, enough. if my car is not working correctly, I'm going to a mechanic. <laughs> Um, I can do a lot of things, but I'm not a mechanic, nor am I a plumber. And so that's how it is. What, and, and if you have the best interest of your clients or customers yeah. or the people that you say that you want to help, then you'll want to help them in as many ways as possible. And yeah. when you see that opportunity to bring in another person who can really help them, then yeah. help them. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because also then your clients, your customers will trust you more as well. They they, yeah. they realize that it's not just a sales job from you, that you're just trying to get, you know, just trying to get their money and and, yeah. and that's it. But you're actually doing what's best for your client. Um, and I will say on top of that, you're taking the pressure off yourself to be yes. <laughs> everything. Right. I mean, I do. I have clients come to me and it's very flattering at times that they think I can do all these different things and I just have to go. I can't do all those things. I don't want to be able to do all those yes. things. Yes. You know, we're going to identify some things that you need in your business. And I can tell you that sometimes I'll be able to help. And sometimes we're going to need to have to brainstorm who can help you, whether it's someone I know, or you got to go find them. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I have that with some clients with, with the, with the coaching program, the podcast coaching program. 
and um and I I would take them through that and and I and I work with them and, and get them going and I set off the little bird out of the the nest and go fly go fly yeah. and then they'll they'll say well but you know can you can you um can you be the manager of it the podcast can you in other words can I just create the content you know you edit it you post it you do all the things like this and I go I don't want to do that <laughs> because that's not my that's skills, not your joy that's not that's my not joy. joy can yeah. I do it yes do I want to do it not really and if right. if I and I could say it you know it's the Elizabeth Taylor thing you can't afford me she said that to the they were getting ready to do Cleopatra and she didn't yep. want to do the movie she's like you can't afford me and they said tell us what you want whatever you want and she she asked for like a million she asked for like something stupid at that time and then she had a long list a long list of things I want Chasen's chili delivered to me on set every day I want you know whatever all the the, the demands yeah. and the the bloody studio went okay <laughs> she, she was like damn it damn it but, it. Uh, but that's how and she made you know beautiful yeah. movie history but yeah no I, yeah. I i would say if somebody wanted me to do something that is not in my joy they would have to pay me an exorbitant amount of money because yeah if if it's doing something not joyful i need to be compensated with something that could bring me joy does that make yeah. sense and over the long term, you want to lean towards the joyful. I mean, yes. as much as money is a nice thing, what we end up getting trapped in sometimes is, oh, they're paying me exorbitant fees. So let me let, let me, me do go do that I thing. Hate. <laughs> let me do something I hate. And I think there's so much that goes hand in hand here. But this idea of when we are leaning into our joy, we're leaning into our genius, our skill set, mm -hmm. what we love. And when we allow ourselves to say no to other things and say, okay, well, who else can do that? We have that abundance mindset. We allow other people to then be in their joy in collaboration with us. I think it's a beautiful way of operating. And I think the more we can all lean into what is my joy? What is my skill set? What is my strength? What is my genius? The more we can actually serve our clients. And that's what it's all about. Right. At the end of the day, especially if we're talking to you coaches and consultants out there. Yes, yes, we are. If we're if you're saying that your client is the number one most important thing, then you need to do yeah. what's right by them. Yeah. And that also means yeah. if, if you're not the person. It's the same thing right. in relationships. If you're not that person, if you don't like love that person that you're with and think that they're the bee's knees, as my grandmother would say. <laughs> then I step love that away. phrase way step away let them have some happiness yeah. you know yeah. yeah oh my gosh I've had yeah. such a good time talking with you Me too. I could talk to you forever you're welcome back on out of the box uh, at any any time uh just let me know if you've got something yeah. new you want to you want to talk about yeah um but let's let's talk about um people can find out more information about you by going to your website and yes. I'll make sure I have the link in the show notes but it's um, Aaron M Baker will spell it all out for you. So you don't have to yes. worry about that. Just click on yes. the show notes, uh, the link, and also they can find out information. We'll have a link to your book as well. Yes. Uh, your yes. joyful AF book. I'll show the cover just so if people on the YouTube can see, this is what it looks like. <laughs> With a little bow tie a little, on little it. bow tie on it yes hold that up again hold that up again yeah. so the, the full title and we'll have a link in the show notes it's called yes. joyful af the essential business strategy we're afraid to put first by yes dr aaron baker uh, yes PhD, girl phd uh, yes i love it yes um thank you again so much aaron i, I really appreciate you're welcome you on and i want to thank you wonderful listeners on all the major platforms apple spotify pandora you name it uh amazon all those great places and also for those of you the audience uh, watching on youtube thank you so much remember that you need to subscribe and knock that bell click that bell because then you can be notified of upcoming episodes as soon as they are released you get a little notification so make sure that you do that and if you want more information about the podcast you can go to out of the box with christine.com and if you want more information about me you can go to christineblasdale.com all those links will be in the show notes as well as Aaron's website and book. So until next time, I want to just remind you to always think outside that damn box. Bye for now.